talk of a, of a conference, but in this case, it's, actually it's the opposite, because as already we had many lectures, all the important concepts have been intro introduced. So, so I can go actually to almost straight to the, to the results. I'm gonna, as Van der say, going to talk about reconnections, vortex reconnection in superfluid. So basically, almost all what I'm going to say is in, is in this paper with Alberto Villas and Davide, was published uh, some time ago. And the last part, we, we hope to be able to submit it uh, soon. So, so about reconnection, you know more or less what it is, is what is in the background of the image. You have vortices that will change topology. Okay, the, the main idea is to, to understand and quantify this, uh, this problem. So I already showed you this picture yesterday. So just to remind you, there are all these scale separations, and I'm really now worried about this part here. That is what I want to, to start. Last one I explained about Kelvin waves. I didn't talk about this. So this is the main part of this talk. Uh, so this one, again, I can, I can skip it. It's just the idea of for quantum vortices like being a small, small tornado. And the idea, what I'm showing now, it's, it's I, I want to give you the taste of what is a reconnection and to, um, to show you that it's actually quantum turbulence is a bit complex. This is some kind of, I can kind of, I try to explain a bit just visually all the scale separation. Thought I cannot, of course, I'm not able to go from the answer to the meter, okay? But the idea is this. So this is the, the flow that Mark introduced uh, at the beginning of the week. It's so, it's so, so called the Taylor Green. Whatever it is exactly doesn't matter. The just idea that the initial condition is such that you have very large scale vortex ring, okay? So, of course, the red liners are vortex ring, and this bluish rendering corresponds to small fluctuations about the mean density equal to one, what is given here, okay? So what you will see is the evolution of this flow, okay? And it's given by very complex thing. Then you get a kind of tangle in the middle, and system evolves, evolves, you get complex. At this time, a bit before what, is what we are seeing now, you will see what is a out of turbulence, so a very coherent range of vortices, and then, then eventually they interact, they reconnect, they meet sound, sound interact with vortices, they are damped, and eventually if you keep running in this simulation, everything will thermalize and you will just get a final thermal bath of the response. Okay, so this is the large scale motion of turbulence, okay? And now you can do exactly the same simulation, but just zoom in, okay? Just pay attention of what is going on in this small square. And this is at the early stage. And what you see is a reconnection. Okay, the reconnection takes place in any 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 moment in many places of the fluid. So you see reconnection, and followed by the reconnection, this Kelvin wave that propagates away from the reconnection. So this is this kind of small scale dynamic that I'm trying. To, I will try to address today. Okay. So this is the main topic of uh, my lecture today, and it has an intersection with this part here. Okay, that corresponds to the sound emission. So. And of course, I'm a, until now I've been always working with the Tayeski model. Everything will be described in this uh, in this context. Okay. Uh, you just need enough for computational power, basically. Okay. So so it's a, it's called a, it's a pseudo spectral code. So basically, the, the you go in the Fourier space back and forth. Why you do that? Because Laplacian is very simple in Fourier space, but nonlinearity is not. So for the nonlinear term, you just go to physical space, multiply the fields, and go back to Fourier, and add up all the terms. Okay? There are some technicalities if you want to do it properly, and then you advance the system in time. Okay? And then if you want to do such simulation, you cannot do it in your computer. You need to parallelize okay? and uh, go to a big cluster and uh, make something a bit more complex. Okay, there are the simplest answer, the system is time reversible, okay? But of course, it's discrete, it's floating numbers, okay, there are 16 digits. You can see, imagine that it's a dynamical system that has associated Lapin of exponent, okay? So this Lapin of exponent will give you the time until you could, which you can go. And you can compare this with the round noise. Of course, if you go beyond, uh, everything is round off. I mean, you will not be able to back come back. At the scale of that piece, of, of the last image, if I turn time back, 
I will get almost the same thing. Yes. Okay. It has to be extremely long. Okay. You have 16 digits of precision. So it's, uh, and if you're not happy, you go to quadruple precision and you will get even more. But this is costly. Okay. So what I'm showing here is vortex reconnection. Okay. So there are three. So in this case, I just choose a vortex node because it's, it's, it has been shown in many occasions. It's, it's a nice example. So the, f the first picture here corresponds to an actual experiment. It was, was done with water. So it was they and the people of, uh, and then the group of William Marvin, they managed to create a very nice vortex node in water. They are able to visualize it. And, uh, and also then to very nice imaging. What is given here? So basically, they create the knots, they set the bubbles such they are already in place, and they look at the time evolution in water. So one of the things they observe is nice vortex reconnection in water. Okay? So this is a classical flow. Okay? And uh, then the, the study many other things that are not relevant to, for my talk uh, now. So you can do the same. You just take a knot, put it in every stock. Okay? The same, you need a big box to be able to resolve it. And then you go, okay? So this is, a, is more or less the equivalent of this, okay? But in average stocks. And what you observe is pretty much similar, but it's much more complex. As you see, there are these structures that go, and stability that go bridges. And the system at some point become, looks much more dissipative, okay? And if you want to give an, uh, some analytical theory of that, you can imagine that it's uh, super difficult. On the other hand, the last one is a numerical simulation of a vortex knot in the gross pitayeski model. So this visualization is actually not the wave function. So it's we do, we do the simulation. We track the vortices with the algorithm that I explained you yesterday. And we visualize the vortex line. So this is a simple 3D plot of a line in space. So this is something we can do with no problem. And then you don't notice it now because it's all red. But actually, the color map will be proportional to the curvature. Okay? And you will see that it's evolving there. And the little square is a zoom where the recognition will take place. And the arrows are the tangents of where the vortices will recognize it. And what you observe, that you generate a cusp, okay? tangents become anti-parallel, and then the system goes. So if you look at the complexity between these two, it's clearly this is much simpler. And we are interested to in solving or trying to understand reconnection in superfluid because it's somehow you, we have the hope to do something analytic that can help us. And you could expect that even GP will be a, a good example for water, provided that you are looking at scales, that, that you have a, a knot or a ring that is much, much larger than the curve. You could expect that even GP, that is for a superfluid, could also maybe give some nice um, idea of this. Okay? So what we did, actually, we, we study, we wanted to be a bit generic, and we start with numerics, and I study different cases. Okay? That's more or less the cases that you, you can find in literature. So the, the first one is two vortices that are initially perpendicular, two that were antiparallel with some, uh, some, uh, some perturbations, so they will develop a curve and stability, the knots, okay? and, a ba and also a tangle. So like the, the one I showed before, so basically we are able to see the lines and find some reconnection. So this is a zoom at the reconnection times of the all corresponding times. So you basically see that the, the reconnection is, this is two reconnection between two different lines, and this is a self-reconnection. And here we look a number of reconnections inside the tangle. Okay, here you have one, and then will be another one over there. So the first thing you want to answer is the simplest question. Luke already told us a bit. Okay, what is the minimal vortex distance? How this scales with a function of time? So if you are a good physicist, you will say, okay, first of all, tell me what are the physical length or parameter of the system, I would do dimensional analysis. And this is actually different. So the idea is, okay, you have the vortex core size, it's a smallest scale before reconnection, you have the distance, that is what we are looking for, and the system size. And you have the most important thing is the circulation, that is just L2 divided by T in, in units. So then if you assume that the distance you are looking are much larger than the core, okay, but much smaller that either the system size or the size of the ring, then you should get rid of this and get rid of this. So the only choice you have for delta is to be proportional to gamma times t to the one half. Just simple dimensional analysis. With a prefactor that of course is a number without dimension, dimensionless that dimensional analysis cannot provide you. Okay? 
So I, I won't go through the old literature that was uh, already done by, by Luca, okay? but there were several discussions concerning what are the exponents before and after, can be different, maybe not, maybe yes. A big discussion, okay? So as Lucas said, we are all more or less, uh, we all agree now that it's one half if you're looking at, expon at times that are very short. So how we do study this? So this is, uh, let's correspond to the lines of this tangle, okay? So these are the tracked line. And the idea is we just look at this, okay? And see what, if there is, so you see the time sampling is not uniform, so it's refined close to reconnection. So you have one here, okay? Then you will get another one there, okay? And finally, one over that. So over this small period of time, there are three reconnections that we can study, okay? And we define two quantities, delta minus, so it's how the distance between two vertices evolve with time. The minus is if, if because it's before reconnection, and plus because it's after reconnection, and we want to look these two quantities, okay? So the result is, is plotted here, so this is uh, lin lin, okay? It's, it's not very useful, but this is log log, okay? for all the different cases. And uh, you really observe t to the one half, no matter if it's before or after reconnection, okay? So here it's uh, in blue is before, and red is after. And here there are many lines because there are many reconnections inside the tangle, okay? But you might notice that there is a difference between the prefactor before and an after. And this is an important thing that I will, I will, be, I will be coming back in a, in a while. Okay, very good, we have this scaling. And if you plot, as I said before, there's a big difference between this number. For instance, for this case, they are quite similar. For the nodes, A plus, the constant in front of the time is more or less the same. And for this, which one, there is a big factor. So you can summarize all this difference in this kind of plot, okay? You just plot the value of A minus versus the values of A plus for all this rec the reconnection that I study in this work. So the first remark that they all lies in this, in this plot, okay? So it's always larger than one, that means that A plus is always larger than A minus. In other words, the scaling is the same before and after reconnection, but the factor, prefactor that is in front is always, or almost always, larger than one. It can even be quite large, meaning that something happened in the system that they, they always approach with one, one rate, but they separate much faster, okay? So this is something that I, I, I would like you to keep in mind, and that there is this factor, okay, A plus over A minus, that kind of measure this irreversibility in the system that will be appearing all along my lecture that you might remember that it plays a very important role. Good, what can we say from another limit, that is the limit when the now I'm looking at the very close, so now I'm looking at distance that are smaller than the healing, so they are really about to recognize. And uh, there is an analytical result that is due to Sergey and West, where they are also able to predict. So the idea is vortices reconnect in a kind of hyperbola. Okay, you have two asymptotes, asymptotes here. Blue is, let's say, before reconnection, so they will go, what they will approach, and they will separate, okay? And everything should be parameterized by this angle. Okay, so this is, you do some analytics, and you can get an evolution for the line. The idea is super simple. Okay, it's very hard to have a, an idea that, is, that gives a, a powerful insight of the problem that is very simple to do, and the idea is close to reconnection, size is very small. If size is close to zero, I can drop this term. If I drop this term, I get a very simple equation that is just the Schrodinger, and this is something I can solve, okay? If you do that, you will find that the delta also scales like a t to the one half with the gamma. Of course, this, again, you can get it from dimensional analysis. But the good thing, that is this is an analytical result. <coughs> so the, as I told you, the calculation is, is, is very simple, okay? So it takes one page to, to be derived, and I actually will show you how it is, because then you, it will be very clear uh, how, how to generalize to, to a more general problem. So what is the idea? Okay, I don't know, everyone can see? Yes? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, so the idea is basically to take these two asymptotes. Okay, so I will drive my coordinate system, okay, x and y, and two asymptotes. And so blue is before, so I will have one vortex that is reconnecting, coming to here. And two other vortices that will separate 
of the reconnection. So the idea is to say, okay, I want to solve this very close to reconnection, so I need to give a good answer, okay? So what is this line? So this line has satisfies a very simple solution that let's say that g square plus min minus beta x square equal to zero. If I solve this equation, I get these two asymptotes. So of course, I need that beta to be positive, okay? What is the solution of this is just, okay? And then, of course, you get immediately that this angle here, if you call it phi, you get that square root of beta This is trivial, okay? So this gives me one, two asymptotes. So the idea is, okay, I will start with an initial condition at time zero, and I will use the Schrodinger equation to evolve. So the idea is that my vortex at the reconnection times is a bit degenerate, and they're all lying in this asymptote. Okay, so I want, and I remind you that a vortex, in principle, satisfy this. Okay, a vortex is defined by this equation. So how do I do? Okay, simple. So this is the uh, asymptotes, asymptotes, and I just I need to add a theta dimension. So if I want to do it 3D, I need to add this. If I just do this, uh, if my wave function is just this, it will be something that is a zeta invariant, but it's not a vortex. So I can just say, okay, let's do it like this. I don't want to mess the notation, so let's say, and theta equal to zero. Okay, and let's consider this system. Of course, the solution is the same, okay? And then if you want to do your wave, fun wave function, you will say, oops, you will just take psi at the reconnection of x to be one of the equation, let's say zeta, And then you say, if you want to find a vortex, you just say, okay, and you immediately get these two asymptotes. Okay, that's, that's trivial. And this can be plus, can be minus, we don't care. So it can be plus or minus, okay? So let me call this little s, okay? And s will be plus or minus one. Good, this is simple, so now, as I'm solving Schrodinger equation, that is simple, so it's I the T, okay? This is trivial to solve from here. I just get that psi of x, y, theta t, just the exponential of I t, Laplacian of psi naught. Just solve this. This guy is, is quadratic, so basically this, you can replace it by one plus i t Laplacian, okay? And then you get that psi x, y, z is just psi naught It's a simple calculation. If you now you can gather the terms, that will be, if you take the real part, will be S minus the imaginary part of psi naught, so that will be mm, plus this will be minus T, um, let me see. Uh, ta, 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 ta. The real part is theta minus minus yes. I will do it. I T Laplacian of psi naught, that is just two one minus beta. 
okay? And then you get the time evolution in this linear regime. So now it's simple. If you now want to look for the vortex, okay, you will get that. If you look for psi equal to zero, that will give you two equations. So first, the uh, and this is a minus because there is a minus there. Okay. So if you look for the real part, you just get that s z minus 2t 1 minus beta equal to 0, and if y squared minus beta e squared plus zeta going to 0. Okay, so these are two equations that evolves your reconnecting line as a function of time. So now, you can consider, for instance, three reconnections, so t negative, let's say, okay? And you replace s here, so basically you get this equation, or always you get, sorry, first, equal to minus z, so this is equal to minus 2 s y minus beta. Okay? So let's now consider t negative. Okay? And uh, let's say that this guy here is t negative, and this one here will be t positive. This is just an arbitrary convention, and you don't care. How you see? So. Now you can you have to impose a restriction, okay? So for instance, if this is your your vortex, so you can evaluate it at x equal to zero, okay? And if you evaluate it at x equal to zero, it will give you this, okay? So now from from here, from here, you will get the distance between the two reconnecting vortices that is given by this. So basically, delta minus of t, okay, will be just simple minus 2 t s 1 minus beta. Provided that this is positive. Hmm? This is totally, this is a very, it's a flat connection. So it's just moving upward. If you see here, Zeta is moving with time. So it's go from, so in this convention, it goes from down to up. But there is no other dynamic that just moves the vortices like this. This is the simplest case, okay? And then you get, from this calculation, delta minus, okay? That is what is basically written here. So now if you look for the other case, that is um, t larger than zero, it's a bit the opposite. You have to evaluate at y equal to zero. The same equation here. So then you get minus beta x squared to us y minus beta. Okay? Now you're safe. You don't have to impose anything because this guy here is positive by this assumption there. And so then this again, this is the distance and delta plus of t will be just simply of 2ts 1 minus beta. Okay? That's give you the approaching and the separation rates. And the last thing, the almost the last thing that you want to do is, okay, now I want to take delta plus of t divided by delta minus of t, that is by definition the prefactor a plus over a minus that I was saying before. And this is just a plus is here, the one minus beta cancel with this one, sorry, this and this is divided by beta, it's here, and you just get one divided by beta. With the condition that s has to be positive, but s can be plus or negative. So in principle, you just get that one single restriction, that 
beta has to be positive, okay? If you want to be kind of generic. That means that A plus divided by minus, the only thing you get that is positive. It can be smaller or larger than one from this calculation. And what else can you infer from here? If you look at this guy, so this now, if you allow me, you can call it, I can call it phi minus, okay? This here, I can call it phi plus. Yes, but S can be negative. It depends on the value of S. S can be positive or negative. So if I take S positive, I have one bound for beta. If I take S to be minus one, I have the other one. So probably I have no choice, the peculiar choice of the value of beta. And there, what? Uh, this should be phi plus, sorry, okay? And if you want to solve, uh, where should I write it? Maybe. Yes. Phi minus, uh, let, let me finish, that's okay. So I have, of course, phi plus plus phi minus equal to pi, okay? If I want to, and now I know that beta, square root of beta is tangent, so then I get that um, A plus, divided by minus is one divided by square root of beta. The square root of beta is tangent, so this is one divided by tangent of phi minus, and phi minus is pi minus phi plus, so it's okay. And if you are good with trigonometry, you will know that it is just tangent of phi plus divided by two, okay? So basically what I'm saying here, okay? So this beta parameter, actually you don't care what it is, is just how you choose these uh, asymptotic lines will set actually the ratio be between after, so before and after reconnection, okay? So as you see, the calculation is quite simple. It's just some basic conics. Sure, 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 please. I go, we go below, absolutely. Yes, this is one of the, the, of the conclusions that I will say at the middle. If you look, for instance, this guy here, this is a healing length, and so we go up to 10. So from 10 up to, well, let's say, a third or a fourth of a healing length. So what I'm showing here, so this calculation should be valid up to here, okay? It goes beyond. And this is the key point that I will use later to, to do kind of asymptotic theory. So I cannot, I cannot say now that you can use this theory as a kind of a matching for an, some other theory that you could develop at a larger scale. Okay. So very good. This is, is basically the, the calculation that were made by, by Sergey. And the problem is that uh, with David Alberto, we realized that this was not enough to describe what was going on. So what we did actually, we generalized. So what I just showed you is this ansatz, okay, with this term to be zero, okay? And we, have, we, we realized that it was not enough to describe what was, was is going on, and we have to bend a bit the reconnection. So what it is, so what I did, I put two reconnecting lines in a plane, and I made my calculations. So here are the two vortices, okay? What we did, okay, this is not enough. I have to bend it a bit, like this. Okay, and this is simple to do. You just add this term here to your uh, initial condition and repeat the same calculation. Of course, now you add some more extra parameter, okay? And you, everything become a bit more boring. You have to be more careful with the bounds so that uh, everything works in a proper way, but at the end of the day, you just get your vortices that are written like this, okay? And uh, what else? So just remember here, they have one parameter called gamma that kind of relates what will be the, the, the torsion close to the reconnecting point. At the reconnecting point, it's always flat, but very close, there can be a, a bit of torsion. 
So if you repeat exactly the same calculation, delta plus, delta minus, you get the same, no mystery. And if now you look at the ratio of A plus and A minus, it's slightly more complex of what I wrote there. But it's at the end of the day, whatever the parameters are, it's always positive. It's always smaller or larger than one, depending on the, how you choose the branches of the solution. OK? Yes. Uh, it is here. It moves a constant velocity in Z, but also have some components. It's a bit bended as well. Uh, it's actually okay. It's a very local calculation, so it's if you want to extend this, it should go to infinity. Okay, so it's a kind of a parabolic shape in that direction. Is that, is that your question? Or yep. No, 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 no. It's just in one direction. Okay, it's a cylinder, not an sphere. You could maybe add. true, you could try to investigate what will give you, you could actually put it in a sphere and see what happens. We didn't do. You know. uh, the problem is you add a third order terms. It's a bit difficult because we know how to solve a quadratic equation and it's simple. If you add an extra term, it will be a cubic equation. Still, you can solve it, but it's start to be a bit uh, not nice. But yes, you could. But then it starts to become algebraically a bit complex. And at some point, maybe you will need numerics, and the idea is not to do much numerics, at, at least for this part. OK, so this is just OK. Up to here, this doesn't give you any new information respective to, the, to that calculation. OK? But as I told you, there are cusps okay, that are generated. And this happens really at the time of clo very close to reconnection. Now, this is something you can investigate because you know explicitly what is the parameterization of, the, of your curve. What is curvature? This is just expression that is there. It's a second derivative. Okay? And what, what everyone expects is that it's to have a kind of self-similar behavior at the reconnection point. Okay? You see a cusp. When you see a cusp, you say, OK, there should be a way of scaling time and space in order to get something that is self-similar. And this was already suggested by Schwartz a long time ago. So the simplest way is to say, OK, kappa, the curvature, is a function of the arc length and time. And what they will do, I will just scale it by, the, by its maximum value times a function phi, plus and minus, so it's maybe before and after, of a function zeta. And zeta is just the arc length rescaled by the same time dependence. And if the system is similar, you should get just something that depends. If you plot k divided by k max as a function of this guy, it should be just a nice universal function. And this is something we, we first check very close to reconnection. So here are all the cases that I, I showed you before. And you see, OK, but anyway, in order of magnitudes, everything seems to be relatively OK. But we could say that there are different phi's because they are not all collapsing on the same curve. But actually, from the calculations I made, if you try to look for this solution, you get something a bit nicer. And you get an expression for this uh, self-similar form that is written here. OK, it's quite specific, plus two subleading terms that I will comment a bit later. So what you see that actually on zeta, the self similar vari variable, there is this A that appears. Okay? This is something that it was it's just not possible to guess for dimensional analysis. So now it tells you, okay, maybe we should plot all these curves as a function of this guy, containing the information of A that we can measure from the approaching rates, even at scales larger than psi. And what we get? A perfect collapse of all the curves close to reconnection. And the dashed is this analytical prediction. So up to there, we are very happy. So we are able to predict the result. OK? Fantastic. And now we say, OK, but this is just for one time. So the self-similarity implies that some relationship between space and time. And this is something that you can check. So this is one another analytical prediction that you get from this uh, linear calculation is that the, cur the curvature at the maximum will diverge as a t to the, one, t to the minus 1 half. This you can also guess for dimensional analysis. This is 1 divided by a length. So yes, you expect the same as delta. Okay? But there is something that you cannot guess from dimensional analysis. If you look at the curvature before and after and look at the ratio, this is scales like a plus divided by a minus, this ratio to the power 3. This is analytics. And you can look, for instance, in the trifold noid, where this ratio is of order 1. There is no big difference. 
this is the scaling in time, and this is I compensated one of the plus by the corresponding value of the A's, and it worked well. And the case for the anti-parallel that was, was the mo most extreme, where this value was four. Even here, like four to the cube is a big number, okay? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big number. Even for this case, you kind of get a good agreement of this is scaling, okay? That's nice, so this tells you how K-max evolves, but let's try to, this to, to, to see this cell-similar evolution. So this is the cell-similar evolution of the nodes. So if you just plot cap as a function of S, a function of time, you just get the, this kind of curve, so everything is a big cusp that's going to the right. If you renormalize everything, boom, you get what you expect, cell-similar evolution of the recognition. So that's fantastic. But the problem is that it's not generic. If you look at another case, for instance, this one with the large value of A, there is no cell similarity. It's broken, okay? But this is something you can understand from this calculation. If you look at the asymptotic expansion that I, I brought down, it was this curve here that is represented by the, the asymptotic curve at the reconnection time, plus a correction. But this correction depends explicitly on time. What it means that the first non, uh, the, the subleading terms depends on time, what will break the symmetry, the cell similarity. And what is breaking this time? There are two coefficients. One is gamma, the torsion, and other is eta is basically the deviation of this ratio with respect to one. So basically the fact that we have some torsion at the reconnection times, it implies that you could expect some bre breakdown of the cell similarity. Okay? Uh, what is just better this time? So then let's look at the torsion. Just this I will go a bit faster just to not to be because I might be a bit short of time, maybe. No, it's perfect. So if you do also analytical prediction for the torsion, now if you want to do numerics and compute torsion, it starts becoming more difficult because you now imagine you have a tango, you're tracking the lines. Then when you have this line, you have to take three derivatives in a, in a messy situation. It starts to be a bit tricky numerically, but the analytics you can do. And you get the torsion is zero, of course, at the reconnection point. But if you look the torsion close to the reconnection point, diverges with this power. And the ratio of these slopes of torsion also scales with this magic parameter A. And this is just uh, a representation of the solution of the linear model. So this is analytics. And you see this kind of shocks that create if the local torsion is not zero at the reconnection time. And we can try to investigate this numerically. We do observe something similar. Of course, all this noise is just to numerics that is a bit difficult to compute this derivative. But nevertheless, we do observe what is predicted by the linear regime. Okay? Good. So let me a bit su summarize what is going on. Okay? So I show you all these reconnections. Okay? And if you look, what, if you go into the details, you see that actually all these parameters here that are close, where A plus is close to A minus, okay, or the angle is really pi over 2, you get actual similar behavior. Those who are not, they have a big, uh, they have some torsion and create this kind of shock at um, the reconnection time. So there is a kind of uh, important role of the torsion that might be due to Kelvin wise that they were before, who knows, with or with something that we need to investigate a bit more. But there is a, let's say, one-to-one -one relationship between these extreme events, vortices that separate much faster, and the local torsion of the reconnection. It's one of these, I don't remember. One of them is lying here, one is here, and the other one, this one that is there, yes. Okay, so yes, that's a good question. How generic is this result? So what we did net, next is this. Here there is no torsion. Eh? Yes, with this calculation I cannot say anything. It can be smaller or larger? No, this is a kind of, okay, it's not clear, but this, in order to have it, you need torsion, okay? And the breakdown of cell similarity, if you take your ansatz and you make a flat, a solution, this actually is not asymptotic, it's exact, okay? So basically the fact that you bend it a bit, the, the, reconnect, the vortex at the reconnection time, gi gives you some time dependence in the next order. 
if you do it flat, this is exactly zero, and this is exact. Okay. It's, there is no proof. Huh? It's just an observation, if you want. What we observe, there is this kind of extreme separation. One, there is torsion that is reflected by this kind of shocks. But it's not. There is no any. This doesn't imply this, and this do not doesn't imply that one. It's an observation. Okay. So good. So this was, was for a little number of uh, of reconnections. Like what we did later is try to do it in a systematic way. So basically, we do two rings. Okay. We link the rings and we move a bit the offsets and uh, play with this distance and run uh, around 30 or 40 runs, changing the size, changing the relative initial distance d, and do the same thing again, okay? Measuring a plus and a minus. And it's turned out that for all possible cases, you can actually expand all with a plus be li lar being larger than a minus. So this is really something that's going on in reconnection. So the, que the main question is why? And this is what I'm trying to answer in the next one. So let's summarize a bit until here, what I've shown. So first, we generically observe always that this ratio is greater than one, okay? This is an observation. And then we have some simple asymptotic theory that is the linear regime, okay? Where we have, we are able to uh, predict the approximate rates, say something about curvature and cusp, torsion, because of the linear regime. Mm -hmm. Yes, this one I guess I get it from a simple bios uh calculation. It's, I think it's just because of the initial condition. I cannot tell you more about the unit. This, yes, it is. It is. If you look here, they are also close to one half. There are some dispersion. Probably there is. There may be something there that is, is worth to investigate. But it's. Uh, we don't know. Yes, it's a good remark. Okay. So I was saying there is some, uh, from the linear regime, you can say something about torsion. And what is nice, you have kind of nice relationship that concerns torsion, curvature, and approaching rates before and after, okay? And what we have seen that is in principle valid only for very short distance, much more than the healing length, but it still works if you're looking at numerical, as a numerical fact that it works even beyond that limit, okay? But from the linear calculation, we have both are possible, okay? No matter if you have torsion or you start complicating the initial answers, at the end you find out that you don't, you are not able to discriminate if it's larger than or smaller than one. So somehow there is a kind of uh, irreversibility in the system, okay? Because Schrodinger equation is reversible, and the fact that as I cannot distinguish between these two, but the system GP really choose one of these choices, one of these directions. So the question, what is the source, or where is the source, or what is the source of irreversibility in the system? Okay. So does anyone have a clue of what should be? Quanons, okay, in which sense? And the waves, what happened with the waves? The waves just go to the infinity. And this is an, exactly, this is an irreversible process, and it's really interesting. So the idea of what I wanna explain to you in the next uh, 15 minutes is how to quantify this and try to explain that this actually should be the case and not the other way around. So the answer is this. So either you have vortices that are accelerated, okay, and you have a vortex that is accelerated in a compressible fluid, it will radiate as an electron does in synchrotron, in a synchrotron uh, system. So this is just a weak process, two vortices that moves or accelerates, it will just radiate very weakly. Or you have something a bit more violent, kind of a pulse that is emitted. And these are two possible mechanisms that could happen. So, a very... Mm -hmm. Yes, but this is a, also Kelvin waves, but there are different time scales somehow. Because you already notice in the linear regime that there is a discrepancy between A plus and A minus. At, at such times, there is no notion of Kelvin waves. Okay? So Kelvin waves will appear just after when you start building a nonlinear effect. Sound, pulses, if you want. Free particles, not sound, free particles that are emitted. Okay, I agree, totally agree. So just 
a very short review on what Mark already explained to you. If you look at the energy, let's say the free energy, H minus mu n, and you write it in terms of the Madelung transform, you can decompose it in three terms, okay? I will go very, very quick to this because it's just what is important to know. If you look, vortices are mainly contributing to this part, okay? So the idea is you can decompose this energy in different terms. So this is, of course, the kinetic part. <coughs> this is the internal energy of the fluid, and this is the, what's called the quantum pressure energy. Furthermore, this is a, uh, is a vector, okay, that is compressible, the divergence is not zero, and you can decompose it in two parts, okay? So basically, you take the full energy of the system, and you decompose it in one, two, three, four different terms. And if you look, basically, what if you want to look at vortices, this is the quantity that you need to look. If you look, want to look at waves in general in the system, whatever waves are, they are contained in the other part of the energy, okay? N namely, in this one. So this is a numerical tool that allows you from the field just to say wha how much energy corresponds to vortices, how much energy corresponds to waves. So this is kind of a movie, one of these rings, okay? It's a bit complex, there are a lot of information. So this is the tracking of two lines. That's why they are colored with different, different, um, they are colored with different, with in blue and green. Uh, there are many plots. So this is, for instance, the helicity, okay? This is the length. But uh, there are many things. What you should look is at this part here, okay? This is the compressible energy of the system. So we managed to, to we really take care of creating uh, rings that are very clean. So that's done in a, with a, with a, it's called a newton raphson So if you look, the, the fraction of compressible energy is two to the ma two ten to the minus three, okay, compared to the total energy of the system. So it's initial condition that is really, really clean. So there is no sound in the system. What you see here, so the dots represent the time that is represented by this one. And at the reconnection time, there is a boom, there is a big uh, jump in the energy, well, then it becomes more complex, okay? But if you look here, the energy, actually, and if you look at the incompressible that is here, there is a transfer from the vortices to the sound, which is what we really expect, okay? So you can look, actually, how much energy was transferred from the vortices to the sound by measuring this delta. And this delta, if you plot it as a function of a plus or a minus, they all seem to be very well correlated, okay? Here, it's some, at the point of reconnection, the vortex also have some compressible energy, okay? So it's, what is really is, it's a mix of everything, but, what is more reasonable is just to, let's say, reconnection is going here. This is a bit kind of the linear time. Right after, you just can say you just, the vortex just left reconnection time. And you measure that. And what is the difference? This difference corresponds to the energy that was lost by the vortex and given to the system. Okay? The time, this time, it's a kind of large time scale. So basically, this this system size divided by the speed of sound. Yes, this is, it's, it's very short, it's around this time here, okay? And it's one in the units of, of the calculation, okay? This, this really depends on the configuration. So there might be other secondary reconnections and many other things that are going on, okay? So from, from here to there, it just, it's just a mess and it really depends on what happened before. But this is the important thing we want just to look, okay? We are not super sure what is going on, but the fact is you have a vortex, okay? And they are very, very, very close, it's as close as one healing length, okay? Even if you prepare it super clean, okay? For instance, there is some incompressible energy and some uh, incompressible and incompressible energy of this thing. So the notion of, okay, incompressible energy is for the vortex, it makes sense if they are a bit separated. When they merge, it's a bit of a mix of everything. Yes, exactly. Okay, let me speed up. So, what is the idea? How can we try to account for this? So we have a nonlinear regime that can be driven by Bios of art mainly, or let's say Gospita Yeski, but everything is complex. We have the linear regime, so I exaggerate a bit, okay, with this one. And then we go to nonlinear regime when the vortex will separate. So the idea is to kind of develop an asymptotic field. And what we can do is use the linear regime, let's say a kind of mathematical black box. Whatever theory we have here, okay, 
let's say I get R minus, so the vortices before reconnection close to the linear time, okay? I take in as an input. What I know, that there is the linear regime that I described you well, that will tell me what is R plus. What is going on here, I show you before, okay? And I can use this kind of a matching uh, theory to, to, to connect what happened before and after. And this is the idea you can explore, explore it. And the idea to, cons of course, to say why one A plus it has to be larger or smaller than the other is based on conservation laws, energy and momentum. Okay, exploiting this, you can look at the momentum of the lines and the energy. So the momentum, it turns out that you can write it quite simply, doing a line integral of the line. That expression is just given there. If you're not fa familiar, I recommend the Pismen book. Okay, so this is super simple to compute. Just take the line, right before entering to the linear time, compute what is the momentum, and then compare with the output here, okay? And we know analytically how it is here and how it is here. So we can this perform analytics. For the kinetic energy of the vortex line, we can compute it here and here, and the simplest approximation is coming from LIA that is basically related to the total length of the line. So we can compute delta P and delta E. Yes, okay. So it turns out, okay, this is actually here, it goes to infinity, okay? So it's not for the momentum anyway, it's finite, okay? Because these two becomes parallel and the integral converges. No problem. Concerning the length, of course it's infinite. But the difference of energy before and after is finite, but independent of how you, what you ever do at infinity. So everything, this is infinite, this is infinite, the difference is finite, okay? And it's only concerned to what is going on at the reconnection point. So you are safe. Okay. It's you have to do it carefully, but you understand when you start looking at the equation that is what is working. Yep. I yes. Yes. Yes, you could. Yes, it will make sense if you try to, you want to see the part, the vortices as a particle. Yes, but I don't know what can you do with that then. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me go further. So as I told you, this is very simple to compute, okay? So just to remind you, this is the idea, so I just, plotting here this uh, linear calculation in the case that is flat. So I will just take the convention that as time goes, the vortex goes up, okay, the vortex goes up. And you compute the momentum, minus and plus, and just get something that is proportional to this. Very simple, okay? And now you s subtract P plus minus P minus, and you see that's only in the zeta component, and it just represented here as a function of A plus over A minus, or if you want, as a function of the angle of the simple. So the remark that is whatever the value of or the angle or the, or the ratio is always negative. What does it mean that it's negative? It means that there is a loss of momentum just coming from the line. The full system conserves momentum. So the only way of conserving the momentum is that to create a pulse that's going accompanying the vortices. So the vortice is always going up. Don't, be, don't think that the, because of the fact that the vortex goes up, the momentum has to be positive always, okay? This is not the case. So the difference of momentum is negative for the vortex line. In order to compensate, there is a pulse that has to go upward with the vortices. And this is something we can check. So this is a bit tricky. So we know where the vortices are. We can go very close to reconnection, define two tangents, define the plane that I, I plot in the blackboard, okay? Once you have the plane, you can define the north and the south pole, okay? And we just define the north pole being the, world, the one where uh, the vortices are moving towards. So this is the North Pole, and this is basically uh, the row as a function of uh, zeta minus zeta r. Zeta r is the reconnection point, and versus time, negative and positive. And what you observe, that indeed here is the reconnection point, and what you observe, this black line, is a pulse that is emitted towards the positive P in agreement with the conservation law. Yes, this is a choice. So then everything, all the change will change. All the signs will change. 
no, you will change the value of the, of the pulse. It's, I mean, it's, it's yes. So, uh, no, no, it's, it's a good question. It, it, it's, it took us a time to understand what's going on, but yes, I mean, just to represent it in the black, uh, there you have to choose one direction, but if you choose the other one, uh, everything changes, okay? So basically, okay. Just from the conservation of momentum, you get that a pulse should go up with the vortices and nothing going down, okay? That was the simplest thing, okay? So just conservation of momentum give you how the pulse is emitted from the vortices. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, right after, okay? You don't see any pulse that's coming from a This is actually also we compute, so because you the, the, the vortices are accelerated, okay, and then you can say, okay, right before the linear time, there those guys are still vortices, and we know how accelerated vortex radiates in fluid dynamics, and you can take this line and compute the pointing vector of the system, and actually it's not predicting that, okay, you get a pulse that is equatorial that we haven't seen, so it's it's really a pulse that is three particles that are emitted at the moment that they are really merging. So just one, maybe, uh, so just one comment. So the calculations I made are maybe valid only where this white spot is, okay? Somehow we are using the calculation here to infer what would be the properties at, I don't know, 10, 20 healing length. So this is really nice with this calculation. It's really an asympt it's a matching asymptotic theory. What? Ah, no, the plot is this model. It's the linear approximation. The pulse, okay, so no, this is numerical simulation of GP. This is, no, wait, it's a zeta t plot. So a pulse, uh, so and this is the density, this is the density, okay, here are vortices that go from 0.9 to 1, the dens mean density is 1. So vortices are just hidden in this black spot, okay? What you observe is this black guy there has a slope equal to C. That is a pulse. Zeta, so this is the North Pole, okay? So basically the, the vortices connect in a random position, okay? So the way we do it, okay, we are very close to reconnection, we look at the tangents. When we have the tangents, we define a plane. When we have this plane, we, s we say, okay, we take the perpendicular direction with respect to this plane, and that's defined the North Pole, what we call the North Pole of the reconnection, okay? And the North Pole is the direction with, with that where the vortices are moving to. Yes. This is the yield, yeah. Serious reconnection time, this spot, The vortex are coming. Ah, I'm just looking at 1D plots, Z versus time. Zero. At the North Pole of the sphere. So we are aligning the system, the, 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 axis, the, the, the system of reference toward the North Pole. This is the vortex, okay? And this is the pulse that's going with the speed C. Okay, look at the values. There are, the vortices are hidden here. Go from 0.9 to 1. Density, mean density is 1. Yes. The very, this one, uh, yes, before the connection. 
is this guy that's moving with a slope. If you make dz by dt, gives you c. Yes. Okay, this is a this is the linear theory. This is just a, a, a sketch, if you want. Yes. Uh, at this point, they should they are touching. Okay. Yes. So this is are the so basically there are the vortices here. Okay. Here are the two vortices that are touching, and here are the two vortices that are touching. This probably is kind of a projection of the vortex in the, in the direction of zeta that still has a depletion because of the vortex. A, so you have to think about a 3D system that you're projecting along one line. Okay? So this is your axis. If you had a vortex like this is your axis, you have a vortex going like here, you might feel that there is the vortex because of density depletion. Yes, but this these calculations, Sergey, are valid here. So these are the vortices. I think it's a projection kind of the, of the vortex. But this guy here, moving with the speed of sound, is a pulse. No, I don't say it's okay because this. I, I'm not fully sure that you can relate this velocity with the actual velocity that, at this scale here, is driven by the self uh, by the bio, by bios of r. So it's not. I'm not 100% sure, 100 sure that you can relate this beta with the speed of bios of r. There is a bit of work to be done there to relate and plot the lines together with everything and uh, actually understand in this sphere how it is going. But it's a bit tricky. Yeah? It's not so simple to plot, to get this kind of thing. But imagine the, the, the vortex reconnect how they want, not in a plane the parallel to the grid. So uh, then you have to manage to do that. Anyway, let me go forward because I think I'm... They do move. Generically not, I think so. It's uh, f t pi over two. Yes, but this is not generic. Okay, let me finish. I'm about to finish. Yes. That this traveling back in time, what could be that is still to be that this is hard to say like now, but what could be this is a radiation of sound that take it takes place before it's still that could be okay, but this going down what happened after reconnection is this that you don't see here that's for sure okay let's. Can I give the last argument of for conservation law? <laughs> because I'm, I'm really late. Okay, so that was momentum, the simplest guy. The next one is the energy. Of course, uh, it's just, if you compute it, it's a simple elliptic E function of a logarithm. Okay, you put it in mathematics and then go for it. This formula here is just for the case of a planar reconnection. In the case of, of some torsion, you cannot write it um, as not even as an elliptic function, but you can always plot, okay? So it doesn't matter whatever the shape is, okay? But you can compute it and plot it, okay? And if you plot the energy of the vortices as a function of this parameter, this is what is going on. Basically, if you plot it as a function of A plus divided by A minus, that is a parameter of the model, it turns out that to be negative in this range. What does it mean? Okay, that in order to, if I wanted to have a reconnection with A plus divided by minus that is less than one, 
the energy after reconnection, just coming from the line, would be positive, meaning that I need energy to make the reconnection. What is not possible? The system, nothing is forcing this, the reconnection, at least in this natural situation. So this guy here is the only possibility what has happened. If I'm not injecting any, if I'm not forcing by some mean the reconnection, okay, the energy after reconnection, just coming from the vortex line, has to be negative. And this is what we compute, okay? So now if this is the, the difference of energy before and after as a function of A, or if you want as a function of the angle, you find out that this is the only region that is physically, physically admissible for the reconnection, okay? So now let's, let's come back to what I had before. So it turned out that all these points are lying there because it's what it was ener energy, uh, the energy was more far away. Also, if you look now, that after this calculation, basically if you see that the difference of energy is zero if they are perfectly aligned. So if A plus divided by minus is one or the angle is pi over two. What should you yes, you should look actually this as a function of uh, uh, one minus this quantity, okay? I'm apologize about this uh, weird way of plotting, but b basically it's one minus A, okay? Or A minus one. And when you see that, if you plot the same data I showed you before as a function of A plus over A minus minus one, now you see extended range, okay, where you have very nice scaling, where you really see that if the reconnection becomes really symmetric in time, there is not energy lost. It's, 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 it's an old plot, okay, I didn't have the data to make it, but basically the idea is if A over this A is this ratio is one, okay, energy should be zero. So it's a bad idea in a log log to plot or as a function of A, so it's basically to plot delta E as a function of A, uh, basically delta plots as uh, it's basically this. Looking at the compressible part of the kinetic energy during the evolution. No, this is numerical data from GP that we use this linear theory to explain that all the points should lie in this part of the semi plane. Okay? So now I can finish, finally. And I think I have quite, no, just a minute, it's okay. So if I want to just make a summary. So there is a trivial theory that is just Schrodinger equation with a nice ansatz that really allows you to connect how what's happened before and after reconnection. And you can use the theory to explain many things, okay? So you can understand what is universal scaling. And that the main, the newest thing is that there is a pulse. There is a lot of things still to be a lot more in detail in this picture. But there is a pulse that you guess, and it is, this is due to uh, momentum conservation. And also this kind of mystery, what is actually quite intuitive, okay? That it was obvious that they, they we needed an energy consideration to explain this. But using this linear theory, we're actually able to give an analytical answer to why these points are all lying in this half plane and not scattered everywhere. Okay? Uh, well, okay, and the energy that is radiated or lost to the system depends on how symmetric this configuration is at the reconnection point. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for all the questions you have already raised. <laughs> what are they? I'm pretty sure this you can do it with a uh, Viosavart if you are 